Christmas. It's great to have you all here. It is still the Christmas season up till tomorrow, so we can celebrate Christmas still. But tomorrow is actually a wonderful day. It's a day that we would celebrate Epiphany. Epiphany, which really can be described as the Christmas for the Gentiles, as the wise men came to see Jesus there, the promised Savior who was born. So it's quite fitting that we are having this the day before Epiphany. It's kind of our Epiphany celebration along with our Christmas celebration as well. And I know these children have been working hard and in eager anticipation to share this message with all of you. So we'll begin the service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever heard the phrase, a picture paints a thousand words? Sometimes things that are difficult to explain verbally can be better understood when depicted visually. Jesus often spoke using parables. These stories share spiritual truths, use, uh, truths using pictures of fa familiar things in our world. A mustard seed, a rebellious child, a wedding banquet, a lost coin. In the same way, God gives illustrations throughout Scripture that point to the central message of his holy word. He promised and sent us a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's gaze with wonder at some of those illustrations and renew our hearts and joy through our Savior, Jesus. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, we are told that God created two perfect humans, called Adam and Eve. Not long after they were created, they disobeyed God's command and brought the corruption of sin into the world. When God gave the first promise of the Savior, he spoke to Satan the tempter, who was in the form of a serpent. The promised Savior would be born from mankind. God paints a picture of this, this offspring of Eve, crushing Satan and all his power underfoot. But the serpent is not only a picture of the problem of sin. Later in the Old Testament, there was a time when the Israelites were plagued by poisonous snakes and dying from their bites because of their rebellious sin. God commanded Moses to make a snake of bronze and hang it on a pole before the people. God promised that all who looked at the bronze snake would be spared from death. Jesus recalls this event in the book of John chapter 3. He shows how it will point to a time when he himself would be hung on a cross to save all people.
After the fall, Adam and Eve's family grew and began to fill the earth. Many years later, God appeared to their descendant Abraham and promised him that his descendants would number as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. God also promised that the Savior would be born from his family. But then, a little while later, God asked Abraham to do the unthinkable, something that seemed to contradict God's earlier promise to Abraham. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Isaac did not die that day. As Abraham was about to sacrifice his son, God stopped him and provided a ram to substitute for Isaac. Each one of us could never make sufficient sacrifice for the sins we commit. Staring eternal death in the face, we see in 1 Peter that God himself provides his son to pay the necessary sacrifice for our salvation. Jesus' perfect life provides the perfection we are unable to achieve on our own. Jesus' suffering on the cross at Calvary pays the price for our every sin. As God the Father rightfully raises his hand to kill each of us for our sins, he stops himself and provides his own son as our substitute to die in our place. Listen as the Apostle Peter explains. Jesus did not commit a sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he made no
grandson of Abraham was Jacob, whom God gave the name Israel. His descendants became the nation of Israel, and they were enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. God used the nation's exodus from Egypt as yet another illustration that points to our Savior, the Lamb of God. On the night before the Israelites were free from slavery, God gave the following instructions to Moses. The blood of the slaughtered lamb protected the Israelites from the righteous wrath of God. Centuries later, John the Baptist, who is Jesus' cousin, pointed to Jesus as the perfect sacrifice, whose blood would cleanse the world from their sins. Recalling the final plague in Egypt and the blood of the lamb by which God's people were saved from death, John points to Jesus with these words.
After delivering his people from slavery in Egypt, God led the nation of Israel to the land of Canaan, which had been promised to Abraham. Here, Israel will become a great nation. They will be ruled one day by King David. The prophet Isaiah tells us that King David's father, Jesse, would be the stump from which the branch of the promised Savior would come forth. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also take this time to fill out those attendance cards that are in the pew in front of you, especially any guests that are here. Uh, we love to serve you and um, serve everyone here. We continue with the offering hymn, Behold, a Branch is Growing, stanzas 1, 2, and 4. Prophet Micah points to the Messiah who will be born in Bethlehem, the town of King David.
Finally, the time came for the Savior to come to earth, for the Messiah to be made man, for the promised and prophesied one to be born and placed in the manger. Isaiah clearly shows us this is no ordinary baby. He came from the majesty of heaven and became like us, human, born of a virgin. He is God with us, Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, In Luke chapter 2, angels proclaim the arrival of the long-awaited Savior of the world to shepherds watching their sheep just outside of Bethlehem. The message and the messengers were a spectacular sight and sound, but the Messiah would be found seemingly helpless and in a lowly place. Shepherds were filled the shepherds were filled with joy and responded immediately.
birth of the Savior would be meaningless had he not completed the work he came into the world to accomplish. Jesus himself pointed to his own death and resurrection when he talked with the Pharisees and teachers of the law about the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The final illustration of Emmanuel points to his death and victory over the grave. Jesus completed the work of salvation when he rose from the dead. He crushed the power of Satan underfoot and proclaimed victory over death, not just for himself, but for all who place their trust in him. Paul writes to the believers in Corinth to assure them that through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, they too will live eternally with him in heaven. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive. From beginning to end, and everywhere in between. God illustrates pictures for us that point us to his son, Jesus, the king of kings who came down from heaven and was born in a lowly manger. He became one of us. He lived perfectly in our place. He suffered the consequence of our sin. He completed the work of our salvation in his resurrection. Because of all of this, we are guaranteed victory over sin and death and promised eternal joy in heaven, where we will join to sing the praises of the King of Kings forever.
what a wonderful message these children have brought us as they showed us those pictures from both the Old and New Testament of our Savior as the Old and New Testament are all pointing through Christ and what he would to do as he'd come into this world to live and die for us so that heaven would be ours. We continue with prayer, then we can bow our heads. Eternal and gracious Lord, in this holy season we rejoice with hearts and voices because you, because you sent your one and only Son from his majestic glory to save us from the salvation of slavery of sin and the agonies of death. He took on our human flesh that he might reveal your divine glory. He became our brother that we might become your children forever. Give us quiet time during these busy days to reflect on your love and ponder the miracle of our Savior's incarnation. Help us to look beyond our gift-giving and gift-receiving and discover the greatest gift, the forgiveness of sins and life with you. Put the joys of Christmas into the perspective of our eternal celebration and let music and art lift our hearts to Christ, who is truly the center of the season. Send us your Holy Spirit, gracious Lord, that the proclamation of the Christmas gospel may lighten the load of guilt and fear and lift our hearts to confident faith and holy living. By the power of your word, bring your light to a heart struggling to understand you and searching to find you, that they may know the joys of this season as we do. Empower us to lead them to your love in our words and deeds. All this we ask in the name of the newborn king, born in Bethlehem, and now living and reigning forever in heaven. Amen. And we join in the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a quick announcement as we uh, sing the recessional hymn, they're not, the kids are not actually not going to recess out um, during that. They're going to stay up here for a picture to be used for the uh, service tonight in the bulletin. So after we're done singing, the kids will remain up here, take the picture, and then the teachers will dismiss them. We continue with the closing hymn then. Now sing, we now rejoice. Hymn number six, 363.